or huge crowds. If we sing from a true heart that loves God, he loves it. Amen. Amen. We declare God's blessing and favor. We declare God's healing and restoration. We declare God's wisdom and direction. We declare God's goodness, grace, and mercy. And we declare God's power over every adversary in his church in Jesus' name. Give him praise and thanksgiving. We declare it to be so, Lord, in Jesus' name. And you may be seated tonight. We're going into the battles of David. Go to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, first and verse 1. We'll go there in just a minute. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1. We're going into chapter 8 tonight, but we're going to start, start in verse 1 of chapter 7. We're not going to read the whole chapter 7, don't worry. But chapter 8 summarizes the victories of the army of Israel over their enemies, events that most likely occurred between chapter 6 and chapter 7 of 2 Samuel. We know that because chapter 7 verse 1 says, When the Lord had brought peace to the land and King David was settled in his palace. So it's obvious, or it seems to very well, that chapter 8 is talking about what happened previous to chapter 7 verse 1. That's not hard to do. If you write a book, usually you write it after everything you're written's already been done. So he's just looking back. He says, this happened. Now, later on, he tells you exactly what happened in chapter 8. And so we're going to chapter 8, verse 1. The Lord helped da David, Joab, and Abishai, these three gentlemen together, to overcome Israel's enemies on the west, on the east, on the north, and on the south. And the Bible covers those areas in this chapter. David had full victory on all sides. We must look at David's military activities in the light of God's covenant with Israel through Abraham. And the Lord had promised Israel the land from the river of Egypt to the Euphrates River. He gave the, the perimeters of it way back in Genesis 15. He said, this is going to be your land, and I'm going to give it to you. And as long as you do what I tell you to do, I'm going to let you keep it. Amen. Amen. And the Lord used David to help fulfill this promise during his reign. Israel had lost territory to her enemies during the reign of King Saul. And that's obviously because King Saul was not doing what the Lord said. And often the Lord would discipline his people this way by letting them lose something that they could have had had they done the right thing. And David, in his reign, recaptured some of this lost territory, but he also expanded Israel's borders and acquired land that hadn't been conquered back in Joshua's days. So he got them closer to the fulfillment of all the land that God wanted them to have. David established vassal treaties with most of these nations that he conquered and set up garrisons, little forts in, the, in their lands to maintain Israel's authority and to collect taxes. Amen? Yeah. Taxes really should be collected from your people you conquer. Now, I'm going to hurt your feelings now, but taxes are collected from people you conquer. Amen. Amen. If you think you're not conquered, just quit paying your taxes. <laughs> You'll find out real quick. Wait a minute. I think I'm going to be a vassal. I hate to hurt our feelings, our American feelings. <clears throat> I told someone one day at work, I said, you know, if you add up what we pay on insurance and taxes, over 50% of our income goes for those kind of things. But that's where we are. God's in control and God's on the throne and do the best you can to live at peace with everyone you can. David's victories also meant peace and safety for the people of Israel. Actually, back in David's day, they were supposed to collect taxes from their enemies and not from their brothers and sisters. And so that was a way of them making money. Nowadays, you just collect taxes from whoever you can. Amen. Actually, we probably should, we shouldn't do that biblically to our brothers and sisters. Don't put a surcharge on something that your brother or your sister was. If you were to, you know, let them borrow it or sell it or whatever, you don't want to just 
tax them to death out of it. It was something you wouldn't do, but something you do to your enemies back in David's day. David's victories meant peace and safety for the people of Israel as they conquered their enemies all around. David's victories enriched the treasury of the Lord, of the, of the nation of Israel, so that the material was available for Solomon to build the temple when he finally did build that temple. And the church today doesn't use military weapons to fight God's battles, but we are still in spiritual warfare, and we still have an adversary, which is the devil. It was more camouflage in that day and time, and God dealt on more of a fleshly level, but now God deals more on a heart level. But we need to look at the faith and courage of David as he went out to fight the battles of the Lord and to bring victory to the people of Israel. And if you're going to have victory, there's going to be a fight. God could give you the victory and you not raise a finger. But most of the time, God said, go in and fight and I'll give you the victory. Most folks don't want to lift a finger. They just want God to do it all. But God tends to work with us and not for us. Same thing with salvation. People who are saved by grace alone aren't saved. Because God, the grace of God that bringeth salvation teaches us what we ought to do. Amen. That's Titus chapter 3. The grace of God tells us what we need to do to be saved. Amen. Amen. Verse 1 of 2 Samuel chapter 8. After this, David subdued and humbled the Philistines by conquering Gath, their largest city. He humbled these enemies on the west, the Philistines. These people were the, tradi the traditional enemies of the Jews and seized every opportunity to attack them. In 2 Samuel 21, go to 2 Samuel 21 for me, verse 15 through 22. 2 Samuel 21, verse 15 through 22. Like any good enemy, you knock them down, they eventually get back up and swing again. The devil, if you knock him down, he's not going to just stay down. Amen. He's going to get up and come back. Once again, the Philistines were at war with Israel. Once again, notice that. And when David and his men were in the thick of battle, David became weak and exhausted. That guy there, Binob, was a descendant of the giants. He was part of the family, I think, of uh, old Goliath. His bronze spearhead weighed more than seven pounds, and he was armed with a new sword, and he cornered David and was about to kill him, the Bible says. But Abishai, son of Zurai, uh, came to his rescue and killed the Philistine. After that, David's men declared, you are not going out to battle again. Why should we risk, snu risk snuffing out the light of Israel? After this, there was another battle against the Philistines at Gob. As they fought, that guy there from that place there killed Sap, another descendant of the giants. Still another battle at Gob. That place, the son of Jar from Bethlehem killed the brother of Goliath of Gath. The handle of his spear was as thick as a weaver's beam. Uh, what is a weaver's beam? I don't know. Some of you ladies know what a weaver's beam is. Inside the thread? Oh, I know what you're talking about. Is it real big? Okay, okay. I really didn't know what it was, so I was being honest. My wife probably thought I was being facetious, but I was actually being honest. She shook her head yes. <laughs> Thank you, babe. <laughs> Nothing like a vote of confidence. <laughs> uh and another battle with the Philistines of Gath, a huge man with six fingers on each hand and six toes. Now, that's an unfair fight, ain't it? Right off the bat, you say, no, nope, you got to knock a finger off, I'm going to fight you, but we're going to make this fair from the get-go. He has six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. A descendant of the giants. Notice they're all giants to defied and taunted Israel. But he was killed by Jonathan, the son of David's brother, Shimei. Verse 22, finally we'll end here. These four Philistines were descend, descended from the giants of Gath, but they were killed by David and his warriors. 
David was a giant killer, but I think more important than David killing giants was he knew how to raise up giant killers. And I think he was more proud of what his warriors did than what he did. Yes, Amen. 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 It's a one thing to be a great warrior. It's another thing to be able to raise up other great warriors for the Lord. Amen. But I will tell you, if you're going to show somebody how to do something, you got to be able to do it yourself. Amen. Amen. I think there's folks that might teach on prayer that don't know how to pray. Amen. That just happens in our world. But we got to be able to do the things that we talk about and say and, and speak about. And so David was a giant killer, and he, he raised up giant killers. And you better be glad he did because one day he was too weak to continue fighting. And because he invested in others, they fought for him. And they protected him in his day of exhaustion. And at least four different Philistine campaigns are mentioned in this chapter. And the text describes the slaying of several giants as well as, as uh, the defeating of the Philistines. Israel captured several cities, including Gath, the home of Goliath. And that was their capital. And they captured that city. Uh, I've often said, I don't know why, but I may be wrong. I don't have any proof of it. But David got five smooth stones from the brook. He only used one to kill Goliath. What were the other four? Well, there's actually four, four giants listed. Maybe that's what it was symbolically. I don't know. What if he'd have got 12 stones? Maybe he'd have killed some more giants. I don't know. That's all just per se. I'm just guessing. I do know there's a place in the Bible where the prophet said, strike the ground. As many times you strike the ground, you'll have victory. He didn't strike but a few times and he quit. He said, you should have kept striking till your hand wore out. Don't strike the ground right now. Oh, my goodness. They thought the pastor wouldn't see them. I bet it's all the people that they were behind, and they thought well, they were hidden back here. Nobody can see us. <laughs> I'm going to preach here in a minute. I'm sorry, baby. I'll get back to the text. Amen. I'm glad I can joke with them, too. <clears throat> Amen. David's men advised him to stop waging war personally because he probably was a little too old for that and he needed he heeded their advice and that was a wise thing to do and so they they conquered the, the philistines on the west and verse 2 says this uh, go back to second samuel chapter 8 verse 2 so david also conquered the land of moab he made the people lie down on the ground in a row, and he measured them off in groups with the length of a rope. He measured off two groups to be executed for every one group to be spared. The Moabites who were spared became David's servants and brought him tribute money. Now, that sounds horrible to me, and it probably does to you too, but it's in the book. The Bible doesn't hide things from us because the way God dealt with things back in those days was more on a fleshly level. And there were some things the Moabites did that angered God. And he paid them back for it. The Moabites had been friendly to David because they thought he was Saul's enemy earlier on in chapter 14 of 1 Samuel. And David was related to the Moabites through his great-grandmother Ruth. And while living in exile, David had even put his parents into the custody of king, the king of Moab. And the Moabites were actually related to the Jews because Abraham's nephew Lot was the father of their ancestor Moab. The Moab, Moabites and the Ammonites came from Lot. Because the Moabites had hired Balaam, however, the prophet, to curse Israel and then led Moab into seducing the men of Israel into sin, the Lord declared war on them. And David was continuing what the Lord declared on them that day. Now, most conquerors would have, this looks horrible, but most conquerors would have killed them all. But David spared a third of them to be tribute to the nation. So that's what happened. Going on to uh, verse 3 through verse 11, David also destroyed the forces of Hadazar, son of Rehob, king of Zobah, Zobah. And when Hadazar marched out to strengthen his control along the Euphrates River, 
David captured 1,700 charioteers and 20,000 foot soldiers. Then he crippled all but 100 of the chariot horses. When the Armenians from Damascus, now go back to that previous verse. I want you to notice it says he crippled the horses. Do you know that was part of what Moses said you were to do? Not to rely on horses. What they did was they would, what's called H-O-U-G-H, I say hold them, hold the horses. That was to cut the sinew of their back leg where they could no longer run in battle. And so that way they weren't useful for warfare. And God told them, don't, don't go ahead and do that so you don't begin to depend. They remember David says, some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we trust in the Lord. Amen. Imagine, though, if that's your battle plan. The enemy's got army tanks, but we don't allow army tanks. It seems like you're at a self-inflicted disadvantage unless the Lord is with you. Amen. And that's what the Lord was doing. He was showing them, you don't need what everybody else needs. You got me. Amen. And I'm going to be more than enough. And David captured 1,700 charioteers, and the, he crippled them. All but a few there. Keep going for me. I'm sorry. Verse 5. Then the Armenians, and the Armenians and the, and the Syrians are the same thing from Damascus, arrived to help Hadazar. David killed 22,000 of them. Then he placed several army garrisons in Damascus. That was their headquarters, the Armeni Armenian capital. And the Armenians became David's subjects and brought him tribute money. So the Lord gave David victory wherever he went. David brought the gold shields of Hadazar's officers to Jerusalem, along with a large amount of bronze from Hadazar's cities of Teba and that place. And when King Toa, to I guess Toi, when King Toy of Hamath heard that David had destroyed the army of Hadazar, he wisened up. He sent his son Joram to congratulate David on his success. Hadazar and Toy had been longtime enemies, and there had been many wars between them. So Joram presented David with many gifts of silver, gold, and bronze. King David dedicated all these gifts to the Lord along with the silver and gold he had set apart from the other nations he had subdued. And we'll stop there. Lots of victories. He's conquered the Philistines on the west, the Moabites on the east, and now the Syrians and the Ar Armenians on the north. Now you got to remember there were some battles that Israel lost with some of these nations where they lost some of their people too. That was warfare. It was then. It is today. War is horrible. War is just horrible. And it went on back in those days. Zobah was located north of Damascus and was part of a confederacy called the Syrians, or what you'd also call the Armenians. Ar 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 However, their neighbors, the Syrians also called that, tried to come to their rescue that day, and they were defeated too. So the whole area north of the Euphrates came under David's authority. He gave Israel important, this gave Israel important military installations and also control of valuable caravan routes that passed through the territory. By defeating the Arme Armenians and the Syrians, David also made friends with their enemies and received tribute from them at this time. Go to verse 12 through verse 14. South is the Edomites. Edom, Moab, Ammon, Philistia, and Amalek. Now, Amalek's very important. Remember who God told Saul to wipe them all out? The Amalekites. And Saul said, I kept the sheep so we could offer it to the Lord. And, and the prophet Samuel said, Hath the Lord as much delight in burnt offering and sacrifices as he does in obeying his voice? The Amalekites, David got them. And from Hadazar, son of Rehob, king of Zobah, Zobah, verse 13. So David became very famous after his return. He destroyed 18,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. He placed army garrisons throughout Edom, and all the Edomites became David's subjects. This was another example of how the Lord made David victorious wherever he went. And notice the Lord made him victorious Amen. <clears throat> on all sides. 
And so the Edomites were the enemies from the south. Now, the Edomites came from uh, Esau. The Edomites, it appears that while Israel was attacking the Syrians, and at that time some other Syrians or Armenians came from the north to try to help them out, but that was the big mistake because David whooped them both and put them both under subjection. Though David and Joab were the conquering leaders in these battles, it was the Lord who receives the glory when David commemorates his victory in Psalms 50, talking about how the Lord gave them the victory over their enemies. David also defeated the Amalekites, a commission that his predecessor Saul had failed to fulfill. And David was victorious over his enemies, and David was careful to always give glory to the Lord. And we should always be careful to give the glory to the Lord. Amen? Amen? For everything. Going to verse 15 through verse 18 now. David reigned over all Israel and was fair to, fair to everyone. Joab, son of Zeruiah, was commander of the army. Jehoshaphat, son of that person, was the royal historian. Zadok and a, a son of Ahitub and Ahimelech, son of Abathar, were the priests. Sariah was the court secretary. Now, when we say court secretary, in our mind, we think of a secretary behind a desk with a pen who pushes paper. But that's not what it means here. This is like secretary of state. Does that make sense? That's what it infers. He was a high-ranking official that was an advisor to David. Uh, Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, was captain of the king's bodyguard. David's son served as priestly leaders. And we'll get at all that in just a minute. And so there was the winning of the battle, but then there was also the administration of the kingdom. And winning the battle is only half, probably less than half. Trying to administer and, and direct a kingdom sometimes is more of a headache than trying to win a battle. And so David had to excel in this area. Winning battles is one thing, and managing the affairs of a growing nation is quite another. And he ruled with justice and righteousness for most of the time. Now, we know he made some big mistakes when it came to Bathsheba and other areas later we'll cover. David kind of let power go to his head. And that's the danger with power is that all of us are in danger. The more riches we have, the more power we have, the more of a danger we are to ourselves. And we have to be very, very careful when we have a lot and we're blessed. David brought uh, the dawning of a new day to Israel after the darkness of Saul's reign that had brought so much bad stuff in. David brought in somewhat of a revival to the people. He was a good ruler, and as a good ruler, you've got to appoint wise and skilled helpers. And we're probably only as good as the people who are helping us out that are around us. And this David did. David's nephew Joab was made the head of the army. And Jehoshaphat uh, had uh, was called the recorder, an advisor to the king. And that's what you would call, he, some, some say secretary, and that would be like to us in our minds, you have to think of a secretary of state. He was a high-ranking official on the king's council. And if we're going to make wise decisions, we've got to have a lot of good counsel. Amen? Zadok and Ahimelech were both serving as priests. This is one time in their history they had two priests, two high priests, I guess you could say. And that was because, we covered this a couple weeks ago, the ark was in Jerusalem and the tabernacle was in Gibeon. And David helped bring those things together under Solomon when he built that temple. And there's a guy named Ahimelech. And he was a priest that was slain by Doeg at Saul, the previous king's command. And we know Saul went way off the track when he starts killing the priest. He starts killing the preacher. When you start killing the preachers, you're in trouble with God. If God sent them, you best leave them alone. And Saul, we know he was way off the track when he starts slaying the ministry. 
And his son, the son of the slain guy named Ahimelech, his son's name was Abathar. And he survived the slaughter of the priest of Nob, and he joined David's band at Keilah when David was running in exile. And he accompanied David during his exile years and must have fathered a son whom he named Ahimelech, who was the same name as his grandpa, after the boy's grandfather was a martyr that day. And Ahimelech, when he came of age, served uh, served David, and he served right alongside of this other guy, Zadok, and he helped David in this time period. You find them working together uh, to bring the ark back to Israel, and you find them where you find him when Absalom is revolting against David. He's standing with David, so he did some good things. Syri, the scribe, was also mentioned here. Uh, most The most remarkable appointment, however, is that of a guy named Benaiah. Benaiah, the officer over David's bodyguard and the mighty warriors, the Bible says. The thing about Benaiah that's unique is he was part of the priesthood. But he was over, and that was a rare thing in those days, but David put a priest over his bodyguards. And Benaiah became an invaluable aid to Solomon during his reign in 1 Kings chapter 1 and verse 38. And while not all of David's sons proved to be worthy men, he had them serving as officers in government positions to help them, I guess, grow and become better. I don't know what it was, but he put them. One thing was, I guess he wanted people he could trust. But even his own kids turned against him. And that had a lot to do with David's own sins that brought that into his family. When he wrecked somebody else's family, his family got wrecked. We have to be very careful what we do to others because what we do to others may come back to us. Amen? But that ain't just bad stuff. The good stuff can come back too. I can bless others and then I can be blessed. The title... Chief rulers, royal advisors, is a translation of the Hebrew word for priest in this last verse when it says David's sons become priests because David's, David and his sons belong to the tribe of Judah. And neither he nor his sons could enter the holy precincts of the tabernacle and minister as holy priesthood. So the word means confidential advisors. As, as, they, as David's advisors. These were men who had access to the king and assisted him in directing the affairs of the kingdom. And next week we'll cover how David goes and finds Mephibosheth and shows God's kindness to him. But David had some battles to fight. And if we're going to have victory in our life, we're going to have battles. And battles make us stronger and strengthen us for the warfare that is yet to come. Amen? Let's stand.